So we all know what's it about, walk about, and what we're going to talk about. Assessment one. So, yeah, mines are now turning to that assessment. That's an assessment that you don't have to do anything about, really, until you arrive at the residential school, because you'll be able to do most, if not all, of what's required for assessment one at, the, at that residential school. And if you look at assessment one, there's three parts to it. The first part is giving me evidence that you have prepared well for the interview and that's going to be in the form of an interview guide that you'll write and submit to me. The second is that you're going to provide me with evidence that you can interview. So what you need to do there is we'll set up some interviews where you interview a fellow student on the research topic which is about mental health, social and environmental factors that impact student mental health. That's the topic. So you'll conduct an interview, record it and then send me a five minute extract. I think I'm going to keep it to five minutes. I was thinking about a ten minute extract but I'm going to keep it to five. And the third part is that you can evidence that you can think about what you've done and that's going to be a reflective piece where I want you to reflect on how the interview went. Now I'll give you some more detailed information on the marking rubric. I'm just putting the finishing touches to the marking rubric. I just wanted to talk about some general stuff today, unscripted, about interviewing. So you get in the right frame of mind for the interview, but also that you prepare for one of the major disasters in a qualitative interview, which is your recording equipment not working. So one thing you can do to prepare for the residential school where we're going to be conducting these interviews is by making sure that you've got a recording device, audio recording device, that you can use. Most of, most of you that will be your smartphone. Audio is so important. The most important thing for the assignment in many respects, if this was a research project, would be your ability to use audio recorder. I want to stick a little caveat to that. Not always. Sometimes you can get away without recording an interview. You know, some people go into the field, they have a conversation with someone and come away from it and write contemporaneous notes afterwards. Uh, contemporaneous notes just mean notes that you write shortly after an event has taken place. And they do that because it's part of the analysis. You know, by the time you get to writing your notes, you'll remember the things that are memorable. You'll have forgotten the things that are not memorable. So in, this, in a way, you're already analyzing the material because you already decided what was significant. There's actually lots of good reasons for doing that. Some people find recording devices quite off-putting. Off, off you know, it makes you a little more self-aware than maybe is useful. And if you've ever blogged with a camera walking down the street, you know the first few times you do it and you see someone approach you, as is happening now, you can feel quite self-aware. So that's one of the reasons why people don't record interviews, so it stops that feeling, that feeling of people being self-aware and embarrassed. Beautifully illustrated my point there. So anyway, that's a little bit of a sideline. For us, we're gonna do it. Usually it's a good idea to do it if you're new to interviewing because you've got a record of everything that's said that you can fall back on if your memory fails you. 
But saying that, you can get complacent because just getting a recording device out, getting your phone out, having an app on it that can record, hitting the record button, and then relaxing, chilling out, can be disaster if the app doesn't work, if your phone's run out of batteries, or if your microphone isn't picking up the conversation, or if there's some other extraneous background noise that's overpowering things, which means you just can't hear a word of the conversation being had. Kind of like having an interview out side when it's windy. I've got a little action, I'm using a little action cam here. Uh, the microphone doesn't have one of the dead cats. Don't, if you're a cat lover, don't worry, we don't kill cats. That furry thing that you see on microphones, that blocks out the wind noise. If you haven't got one of those attached, which I haven't, then you just get this <laughs> buffering. So yeah, the audio recording is important. So what I'd ask you to do is just uh, try out the audio recorder. If you've got a phone, try that out. Try out the recording. Try to get a nice, clear recording of your voice. Now, once you've got the recording um, of the interview, when we do the interviews at the residential school, what you need to do is take that recording away and edit it. I want you to record the full interview and then use um, editing software, which I'll give you a link to if you don't have any available to you. Some really nice audio editing software. You can just decide which bit of the interview you want to submit to me. And that's where you pick the best bit of the interview, you know, if you know what you're doing. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to send me the rubbish bits, you can just edit. Give me a nice little 10 minute seg or five minute sequence segment of your interview that you think is the best bit of your interview that most clearly demonstrates the things that I'm looking for as detailed in the rubric. Now, in getting this audio recording to me, you get marks for being able to provide me with a clear recording. It's so only out of the possible 100 marks available, it's only 10 marks, maximum of 10 marks available for clarity of recording, so it's not a big thing. But if you just want to squeeze out a few extra marks for your assignment, then it's probably a, you have the opportunity of getting those extra marks for providing good, clear recording. The major part of the interview, well, there's two aspects, which is conducting the interview and reflecting on the interview. And here's where subjectivity will rear its evil head. I shall talk to you more about that just after I've got my coffee. Right, I've got my coffee. I'm also got a cigarette. Don't know if you spotted me in there previous uh, walkabout video, having a sly smoke. Anyway, try to ignore the fact I'm smoking. Don't want to set a bad example and all that, you know. So I was wittering on before. Remember that was pre-coffee, so it's just word spaghetti coming out of my mouth until I found my, um, found my source of caffeine. It's all about, yeah, audio recording is really important to get right. You know, the audio recording has to be clear enough for me to be able to hear what's going on. Uh, particularly important for the assessment. Uh, but I ended on, before I got into the coffee shop, that big thing about subjectivity. Da, da, da. Oh, apologies, all I said about the audio recording. It's windy now, so the audio recording's probably a little bit pants. <laughs> Forgive me for that. And yes, I knocked, the, I knocked the camera over just to balance the poor quality audio with the poor quality, <laughs> poor quality video. <laughs> anyway, subjectivity. Subjectivity is going to be really important for two aspects of the first assessment. One is pretty obvious, the reflexive writing. There, you have to engage subjectively with the interview. You're reflecting on how the interview went. What did you do well? What did you do less well? You know, what are the strengths and weaknesses of your approach? Were there questions that were ill-phrased, or did you stumble at any point? You know, what was going on? What could you have done better? And why do you think things happened in the way they happened? What was it about the context of the interview that might have shaped the conversation? But also what might have been about you as interview, the interviewer that shaped the context? And that 
is getting to that notion that context is really important. You know, every conversation is had within a context. And we are not seeking necessarily to manipulate that context, that we try to create a context where people are best placed to be able to share their thoughts and feelings with us. So maybe a degree of privacy if it's a particularly sensitive topic. So context is important in that regard. Uh, but we don't you know, really manipulate it like an experimental condition. Um, but we understand that we can never remove context. So under, uh, unlike a quantitative paradigm, which essentially tries to get observations conducted within a vacuum, where all the variables, extraneous variables, the unwanted variables, are removed or controlled, so that you're only observing a cause and effect relationship. You know, the cause would be the question and the effect would be the answer and nothing else came into it. Ideally, just a computer firing out the questions would be better, you know? Nice and objective. So you'll notice <clears throat> that, again, with qualitative research, it's very differently positioned in relation to context. So, yeah, being able to understand how the context of the interview affected how the interview went, so you can write about that in your reflexive writing, but also about you know, what you brought to the interview, your experience, your prior knowledge, your views on things, your, you know, personal disposition and your cultural background, all of those things, you know, you can pick up on any of those things and bring that in. Now, the best answers, you'll have a look at the rubric and we'll go through the rubric in more detail at a, another time, but what you'll see from the rubric is the most, the exceptional answers to, um, the exceptional Assess assignments will be those that are able to engage in such things in a way that can relate to that big issue, those big paradigmatic issues, you know, big differences between qualitative and quantitative work. Now the other way that subjectivity comes in will be in the, during the interview itself. Because when you look at the rubric, you'll notice that there are a couple of things there which will essentially require you to engage subjectively with the interview. And one is about your uh, ability to listen and to be responsive and flexible in how you ask the questions. So here, rather than just going through your list of questions one by one in the order that you've detailed in the interview guide, that you've um, written before the interview, that you'll be flexible, that you'll, you can change the order of the questions. You might change the type of, the nature of the question, the wording of the question, dependent on what someone is saying and how they're talking. But also, you'll be, what I'll be looking for is your ability to encourage the interviewee to talk. And there I'll be looking for ways that you can kind of show the interviewee respect or affirm their expertise on what they're talking about, show that you're interested in what they've got to say. This is all very much about your relationship with the interviewee and actually affecting, trying to change or affect the interviewee's performance and you're trying to affect it positively, change it positively to to create the conditions where they'll be open with you and have a really nice conversation and say things, um, yeah, to talk fully with you. Which, which is very different from quantitative research. You know, where actually you, what you're desperately trying to do is not influence the participant at all. And you are sticking rigidly to a procedure that you've set out beforehand. And every participant who comes into your research experiment undergoes the same procedure in the same way, in the same order, identical, you know, systematic in that sense. That's not what you'd be doing in qualitative interviewing. So subjectivity will have to come in there, which is about striking up a relationship with the interviewee that's respectful and welcoming and conducive to a person uh, talking fully and in depth on the research topic. So subjectivity is going to come in there. Now, when you are writing your reflexive piece, um, that's the one element of assessment one, which has just got one criteria attached to it, and it's weighted 40% of the assignment in the assignment's weighting. 
Um, out of the 100 marks you can get for that ass assignment one, 40 of those marks are available for the reflexive part. So it, it's the most important bit. <coughs> and there, if you trip over at any point in the interview, you can kind of save yourself. And one thing, yeah, you might write about is the struggle that you may feel in relation to engaging subjectively with the interviewee and forming <coughs> a subjective position in the interview where you are intending to positively influence the interviewee in terms of getting them to talk in rich detail, in depth about the topic. So you might struggle with that and the reflexive component will be a good opportunity just to refer to that. So the only other thing really to prepare for the residential is I suppose um, keep an eye out for people interviewing people. It happens all the time, particularly if you're watching telly, if you watch the news, and I'd encourage you to watch the news, particularly if you're doing qualitative research because that's often the source of really important information to know what's going on in the world and what people in the world are likely to feel strongly about or social issues that are affecting people's lives. That's where you can pick up on some of the important things that are happening around you that might be worth researching because you might be able to affect some positive change in relation to those issues. So watch the news and what you'll find is interviewing happening all the time. You know, the news presenter interviewing a guest. Often a politician. And you'll notice those interviews are a, a very different type of interview than the one we want to run. Those are often some form of interrogation. It's largely because Politicians aren't particularly forthright in telling us the truth. They're particularly aware of how their words might be received. And also they've got multiple competing interests, all looking to ensure that what the politician says works in their interest. So it's a particular type of interviewee, and journalists are uh, not there just to give politicians the opportunity to talk about whatever the politician wants to talk about, i.e. to give a party political broadcast, but the journalist is there to kind of interrogate the politician, to put difficult questions to the politician, and to not suffer insubstantial arguments. Insubstantial? Unsubstantial? Anyway, that's one sort of interviewing. You might also watch documentaries, and there you'll see lots of different styles of interviewing. Um, some interrogative, others more conversational, uh, more supportive, more gentle. So keep an eye out for those things, but also keep an eye out for the natural sort of interviews that happen on a daily basis. When you meet up with friends or family, just be aware that you often are asking questions. Um, you're interested in how their day is going or what's happening to them, or that thing that they're talking about the other time you met, how things went, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, so keep aware of sort of how we ask questions and how we engage in conversations with people in natural settings. Um, it's those natural settings that the ones that we kind of want to simulate in the interviews that we'll be conducting at our residential school. Those kind of nice, sort of informal conversations where actually We'd like the interviewee to speak more than us and to tell us about their thoughts more than we tell the interviewee about our thoughts, but nonetheless still to be able to have a conversation where you know, we can disclose our own thoughts as well as ask our participant, interviewee, their thoughts. So just keep an eye open because um, interviewing is happening all over the place. Uh, the one thing that might happen in the interviewee interview is uh, context might overwhelm you and the context that might overwhelm you is one you're being assessed and two you're on a psychology unit and you will be carrying with you expectations about how a researcher acts and it's always interesting to see how we can suddenly start occupying this strange persona of acting in the way that we feel we should be acting in that context and that's kind of interesting um, it's based on our assumptions about the proper ways of engaging in research and what's a proper way to conduct yourself as a researcher. So that stuff will come out um, during the, the interview that you run and um, could be interesting if you're able to capture and reflect on it. Um, we are 
I suppose this has to do with the qualitative paradigm, is understanding the, the, the nature of context, you know, the social context in which human behavior occurs. And if you watch my video, I hope you're watching my videos. If you're not watching my videos, you're not listening to me now, are you? You're not watching this video. But I don't know if you've noticed, and maybe you wouldn't have noticed because you don't know me as well as I think I know me, but I start occupying weird, a weird persona. When I'm in front of the camera, I start sort of occupying the persona of a TV presenter. I hope it's not too cheesy, but there are cheesy elements to how I present, and I know it. You know, the, my accent will, you know, you take that weird enunciation that, that presenter, TV presenters do. You know, it's, it's intended to try and maintain the, the engagement of the audience. You know, and they will talk like this, which are these signals that where you are in a, in a sentence to try and keep someone's attention long enough prior to you getting to the commercial break so they watch the adverts. You know, so, it, so, so I'd be talking, you know, let me try and occupy that persona. So here we are in the botanical gardens and it is a really nice, beautiful, sunny day. Uh, but the temperature is rising, which is causing me to perspire a little bit. But then again, I do talk a lot about my sweatiness. You know, it's that weird, stilted enunciation, the kind of rhythm and tone. Um, but, you know, I'll be doing that if you're watching my uh, tutorial, my tutorial, our tutorial. Uh, you'll send me with a microphone and a pop filter and I started to get possessed by the spirit of a 1970s DJ. So this idea that context affects our behaviour and sometimes we kind of sense there's a clearly demarcated role and so we start role playing because of that and that might happen to you in the interview. You might start acting a little bit strangely just a little bit odd, a little bit artificial, occupying a role that you're not familiar with but you have loads of assumptions about and sufficient assumptions to affect your behaviour in a way that you suddenly become a caricature <laughs> of an interviewer. I mean it happens, you know, it happens to me all the time. So if it happens to you, don't worry, it's natural, it's normal. Um, but if you're able to, to see it, capture it, reflect on it, and briefly write about it. That would be really interesting. Okay, that's enough. I've witted on. So I'm concerned about, yeah, chewing your ears off, but also concerned about finishing off my coffee. So, till next time. Um, Ta-da! Right, another bit. I don't know if you can... <laughs> Possibly argue that these are video extras, <laughs> off cuts, awful. Perhaps we could say the, the, the awful. <laughs> but I just had another thought about subjectivity and that idea of context. You know that we respond to the context in which we're in. Um, one bit of advice I could give you for the interviews in our residential school is just be yourself. You know because what we're after is you to just draw on your life experience, your attitudes, your pre preconceptions and so on, just to allow them to come through the interview so you can be yourself, you know. But that's dreadful advice in some ways. You know, if, if someone's going for a job interview and you say to them, oh, just be yourself, you'll be brilliant. And that's kind of lovely advice, but dreadful advice at the same time, because the response to that should be, which self? Because we're multiple selves, you know, we act very differently in different social contexts. So, should I go to the job interview and act myself as though I was at a funeral? Or should I act myself as though I was out on a Friday night um, at a social gathering, having a few too many libations or just enjoying myself too much in some way or another? You know, should I act myself as I would sitting in the botanical gardens? You know, what, what self? should I act like? And psychology tells us sometimes, some parts of psychology tells us there's this one true inner self and, you know, that anything except for that is kind of a disintegration of the self and, you know, a sign of a mental illness, like multiple personality disorder. But actually, 
perhaps more accurate to say that we're multiple cells because we act differently in different social contexts. So if in the interview you start being taken over by this weird spirit of a scientific researcher, you start acting a little weirdly. It's not that you're not being yourself, you're just being yourself in this particular context. And that's the thing just to be aware of, you know? That, uh, yeah, there's no such thing as just be yourself. So you always ask, which self? You know, myself in which context? So job interviews, best advice is, you know, act like you're a job interview. No, that's bad advice as well, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. Don't know what I'm talking about. Let's end this video now. I think I've gone, started with no caffeine, now too much caffeine. Um, there must be a point at which somewhere in the middle of these videos where I may make some discernible sense. But perhaps that moment is quite fleeting, if it exists at all. Anyway, enough of this. Till next time. Ta-da!